In the mid-1800s, the healing powers of Colorado's mile-high climate attracted thousands of men and women chasing a cure for tuberculosis. Upscale sanatoriums welcomed only the wealthy, while hundreds of poverty-stricken tuberculars stalked the streets. In light of this tragic situation, a triumph was born. The National Jewish Hospital for Consumptives, a haven of hope for the hitherto hopeless. In the 19th century, tuberculosis was the single most common cause of death in the United States. At one time, more than 80% of the population was infected before the age of 20. Tuberculosis was originally called consumption because it caused people to waste away. As a highly contagious disease, it easily spread in cramped quarters, filthy factories, and crowded public accommodations. Who gets it the most? Poor people. Why? Not because they're genetically more susceptible, not because they haven't eaten as much, basically because they live in more crowded areas with worse ventilation, and therefore are more likely to breathe in a TB bug. Before the discovery of antibiotics to treat tuberculosis, the Colorado climate was thought to be a healthy environment for consumptives. In 1858, gold was discovered in the Pikes Peak District of Colorado. The following year, 50,000 prospectors stormed in from California, the Mississippi Valley, and the East. Many of these prospectors were consumptives. Upon arrival, they often found their symptoms greatly improved. As the flow of gold and silver faded, Colorado became a popular destination for tuberculosis patients. By the 1880s, Colorado's dry and sunny climate had become famous throughout the country for its supposed beneficial effect on tuberculosis. Impressed by Colorado's climate cure, Mark Twain stated, I know a man who was a skeleton when he came and could barely stand. He was a skeleton no longer. His disease was consumption. I competently recommend his experience to other skeletons. Soon, hundreds of people were flocking to the Mile High City. Try nature and be healed was one company's slogan, and it was followed by unrealistically glowing reports of miracle cures to be had in the Colorado sunshine. Physicians in the East recommended that their patients go west. Colorado was referred to as the World Sanatorium. In 1887, the Denver Chamber of Commerce proudly proclaimed Colorado, the mecca of consumptives, and rightfully. For dry air, equitable temperature, and continuous sunshine are as yet the most reliable factors in the care of that disease. As much as 60% of Colorado's population migrated to the state, either directly or indirectly, for treatment of tuberculosis. Among these were many prominent Coloradans, including Denver's Mayor Robert Speer and Colorado Governor William Adams. Wealthy Easterners stricken with tuberculosis gained admission to private boarding houses or upscale private sanatoriums. Poor consumptives followed, seeking refuge from the eastern slums where tuberculosis was rampant. Poverty-stricken Jewish consumptives were particularly visible. Beginning in the 1880s, a flood of Jews poured through Ellis Island, they were escaping the grinding poverty and anti-Semitism of Eastern Europe and the Russian pogroms, brutal riots against the Jews. Many ended up in tenements under poor living conditions. Tuberculosis was a constant threat among the Jews because many of them worked in poorly ventilated, unsanitary sweatshops, an environment in which the disease thrived. These poor consumptives often spent their last dollar trying to make the long trip to Denver in the final hopes of being cured. Tragically, they found no facilities existed to give them treatment or even shelter. Colorado was ill-prepared for the arrival of these sick, indigent people. Locals denounced them as lungers in the one-lunged army, and the state legislature even threatened to pass a law requiring all consumptives to wear bells to warn healthy folks. As fear of the disease spread, tenants, suspected of being ill, were kicked out of cheap hotels and boarding houses. They ended up living on the streets and dying there as well. Many were even thrown into local jails. Publicly, Denver tried to deny the tragic situation. Since no publicly supported institutions for penniless consumptives existed, it was left to private parties to remedy the increasingly critical situation. Awakened by the tragedy of their own people, Denver's settled middle-class Jewish community became the first group to lend aid to the neglected consumptives. The ravages of war, plague, and pestilence are insignificant in comparison to the havoc wrought by consumption. 
stated Rabbi William Stern Friedman, an advocate for public sanatoria. Every year, hundreds of thousands in this country alone die of the disease. To aid in the support of consumptive sanatoriums is a duty then. To spur Denverites into action, to turn this seeming tragedy into a notable triumph, required the persistence of a few concerned Jewish citizens, including Frances Weisbart Jacobs. It was her vision that made Denver a center for the organized treatment of tuberculosis. In the 1880s, Jacobs was the first person to conceive of the idea of a free hospital for indigent tuberculosis victims. Unafraid to touch the ill, she would help them when they fell on the street, get them to a physician, and pay for treatment. The city was attracting needy tuberculosis victims, and Jacobs insisted that the Denver community face the tragedy and realize that these people deserve treatment and facilities. Jacobs lobbied to provide care for indigent tuberculars and found an ally in the rabbi of Denver's Temple Emanuel, William Stern Friedman. On April 8, 1890, middle-class Jews incorporated the Jewish Hospital Association. According to the Articles of Incorporation, the hospital was to be managed and funded by Jews, but it would have a non-sectarian admissions policy. This was the first step towards a triumph for indigents. I'm glad that at last the people realized the necessity of establishing an institution as will be a benefit to the needy. The sick and poor are here already and we must take care of them, said Dr. Robert Levy, a leading Denver physician. A building was completed in 1893 at a cost of $42,000. The new hospital was named after Francis Jacobs, who died of pneumonia after contracting tuberculosis while aiding consumptive victims. After the building was erected, the Jewish Hospital Association faced a major setback, the Silver Crisis of 1893. The Depression swept away Denver's prosperity and the hospital stood unoccupied for six years. Destitute victims of tuberculosis continued to wander the streets. Finally, Rabbi Friedman found financial support from B'nai B'rith, a national Jewish organization which provided operating funds for the institution. The hospital reopened on December 10, 1899 with a new name, the National Jewish Hospital for Consumptives. The hospital was a major triumph in that it was the first institution in the United States to make treatment of tuberculosis victims its primary goal. Finally, there was a place for all consumptives, regardless of ethnicity, religion, or ability to pay. The National Jewish Hospital had a number of positive um, effects. One is that it isolated tuberculosis patients from the general population. It helped them triumph over the disease in several ways. One was that obviously some patients, of course, were helped with the regimen at the hospital. And probably more important, it helped give people a sense of hope that there might be a chance for their recovery. The new president, Samuel Grabfelder, observed in his dedication address, Our facilities and services will be given only to the poor. The well-to-do find no difficulty in securing the best, but the poor are unable to do so, and to them we say, Enter and ye shall be welcome. And so it was fitting that the official motto of the hospital became, none may enter who can pay, none can pay who enter. National Jewish Hospital quickly gained a reputation for excellence. In 1908, it received a special award from President Theodore Roosevelt at an international congress on tuberculosis. In 1914, a building was erected which was the first place outside of medical schools where research of tuberculosis was the primary goal. By 1936, the hospital had treated 20,000 patients and continued to lead the country in tuberculosis research. In the 1940s, thanks in part to research conducted at National Jewish, the use of chemotherapy and antibiotics brought the disease under control in the United States. However, tuberculosis has recently become resurgent, infecting 8.8 .8 million people and killing 1.6 million a year worldwide. National Jewish continues to be involved in the battle against tuberculosis through its educational programs, which train public health workers and clinicians from around the world in tuberculosis control. At its opening, the hospital's president declared, its doors may never close again until the terrible scourge is driven from the earth. Now at a time when according to the World Health Organization, one in three people in the world are infected with tuberculosis, its doors are still open. For those consumed by tuberculosis, Colorado was a center of hope. Tragically, those afflicted with both consumption and poverty were unwelcome. If it hadn't been for the Jewish community and National Jewish Hospital, thousands would have continued to be ignored, shunned, and left untreated. The turn of the century signaled a major triumph as National Jewish, the first free hospital in the world to treat poor consumptives, opened its doors. Denver and the Rockies transformed the treatment of tuberculosis, leading the country in the crusade for public health care. I've got the T-B-Blue